Was geht ab, Ausländer? This is Expat Life Germany, a weekly podcast about Germany as seen through the eyes of expats. So pretty much as the podcast title suggests. This week, we are going to be talking to an Australian who is living in Cologne. He's written some books. He just directed his first movie. He's been here for a while, and he sits down and talks about the story that brought him to Germany. And he has some very interesting advice for expats who are just starting out their expat journey. So stick around for that. We will get to Dwight. But before we do, let's talk about some stuff. Rundfunkbeitrag. Now, as an expat, you will probably come across this pretty early after arriving in Germany. Pretty much the moment you find an apartment or moving to a house or whatever your living arrangements is, you will probably get something in the mail uh, requesting your Rundfunkbeitrag. And what it is, is it's basically a license for broadcasting or broadcasting license. Not that you're going to broadcast, but you're paying a license to get TV channels, radio channels, and so on. The thing is, we were amazed when we got here at how much it costs. It costs €17.50 per month. Per month. That is a lot of money. I pay less for Netflix, and, and there I actually get content I actually want because Probably as an expat, you're not even watching a lot of German TV or a lot of German radio. It's very good to learn German, but when you get here, you're not going to understand any of it. So why are you paying 17 euros 50 a month? 17 euros 50. And don't be fooled. You, you might think, I, I don't have a radio. I don't watch TV. I don't have a TV. It doesn't matter. If you're living in an apartment or a house, you got to pay it. There's one exception, garden house. They don't have to pay it. But if you're living in your garden house have to pay it. <laughs> I guess if you're living in a garden house, though, you probably have bigger problems than paying your Rundfunkbeitrag, am I right? As I said, it's a bitter pill to swallow when you don't really watch German TV or listen to the radio. So what is in the 17 euros 50 that you pay every month? So obviously it goes to radio broadcasts and TV shows and things like that. But it also goes to other things like downloadable radio plays. So that radio play that you listen to, uh, when was it? Oh, I don't know. Never. That is paid for by your Rundfunkbeitrag. Actually, now that I say that, there are probably a lot of Germans that listen to uh, radio plays. Uh, I should ask some of them if they have, because at least that's being paid for. Um, but it also goes to other things like orchestras, accessibilities for people with hearing or sight impairment, um, cultural events, media research, statistics, and all kinds of things. So now the reason I'm talking about it is there has been talk by some kind of group, some kind of Rat, uh, Rundfunkrat, something like that. And they want to raise the Rundfunkbeitrag. They want to raise the fee. And there was talk to something over 18 euros a month. The reason given, um, and this is a good one, is that we, the reason that we're going to raise the costs is to fight populism. So the thinking is, for 18 euros a month, we can afford better reporting, been a journalism, and we can uh, fight populism. So that's great. That's great. You know what? 18 euros. If I'm going to pay 18 euros and we beat populism, that is 18 euros well spent. And But I'm just saying, if I'm going to pay 18 euros a month, <laughs> populism better be dead within three weeks. <sighs> 18 euros a month. So we'll see. We'll see. We'll uh, monitor that and see what happens with the Rundfunkbeitrag. And by the way, if you think Wait a moment, I'm not paying that. I've never heard of such a thing. It might be that it's in in, in your rent contract somehow. So you've you got to check that out and just make sure uh, that it's getting paid by someone in your household. So if you're looking for a good way to justify that run Rundfunkbeitrag, you can watch the FIFA Women's World Cup, which is starting very, very soon. It's been held in France. USA are the favorites, and Germany is number two favorites. Now, usually I have no interest in the Women's World Cup. I'm going to be honest about that. Uh, but the German team did a wonderful promo with Commerzbank. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, you have to, you have to watch it. It's the, there's a link in the show notes to the version with subtitles that Deutsche Welle put out. And they basically translated the text into English. And the tagline uh, in English, at, at the very least, is uh, we don't have balls, but we know how to use them. And uh, it, this, this promo is so amazing. It, it, I'm, it, I'm all in. I'm all in. You've got me, German women's team. I'm watching. Uh, one of the points that they make in the video is that they play for a country that doesn't even know their names. And I'll be honest, I, I didn't know a single German uh, football player's name until, uh, <laughs> until I watched that promo. 
But to be fair, I don't even know many male football players' names. So, Cristiano Ronaldo. Uh, yeah. Hazard, I guess, is someone. So, anyway, at any rate, I'm very excited to get in on the Women's World Cup action. I'm excited to watch a bit with my daughter. She's three years old, and I hope maybe she gets some interest in soccer. The opening match is on uh, Friday on this Friday, actually, France versus South Korea. I think that is the 7th of June. And the Germany opener is on the 8th of June against China. And that will be shown on German TV. So there you go. Rundfunk Beitrag paying for itself already. Uh, that will be an ARD. So just have a look. Uh, also in the show notes are links to some sites with TV schedules. The other topic that caused quite a stir this week was e-scooters, believe it or not. And in May, the Bundesrat, another right, decided that they uh, are allowed. E-scooters are now allowed on streets and bicycle paths, but not pavements, because it would be too dangerous for your uh, average garden variety pedestrian just wandering around with e-scooters buzzing everywhere. As of the beginning of June... You'll see them around, and they're, I guess they're a really cool alternative to walking or cycling, and they're a nif- nifty way to get around cities. But there will be conflicts. So this is from an article on the local.de, and I quote, The presence of scooters will intensify the battle for space on Germany's streets, where cycling associations have long demanded more and wider bicycle paths. Uh, and just this weekend, uh, the past weekend actually, there was a massive protest in Berlin where 90,000 cyclists uh, took to the streets to protest the inadequacy of bicycle paths in Berlin. And on our Facebook page, by the way, Expat Life Germany on Facebook, find find the Facebook page. Uh, we had a quote from uh, one of our one of the users on our Facebook page. Uh, he said. I'm a cyclist, and as long as these scooters keep to the road rules and the right side of the cycle path, I'm okay with that. The problem is that the cycle paths are sometimes too narrow to pass safely. I predict a bit of frustration in the rush hour from cyclists who generally ride faster than 25 kilometers an hour. And I think he's right. We could see some conflict and some frustration happening there. So, yeah, let us know what you think. Like the Facebook page, Expat Life Germany. We also have a Facebook group, which has exactly two people in it as of now. But I would love for that to be a place that you discuss topics like this. So find Expat Life Germany on Facebook, find the Facebook group and join in the discussion. Or you could just tweet at me, Expat Life DE, and let me know your thoughts on the matter. As I mentioned at the top of the show, we're going to be speaking to Dwight Stephen Bonietzky this week. And I'll be honest, this interview turned out to be more of just a fun conversation between him and I. We've known each other for over five years now. We talk a bit about how we met on an air, airplane that was flying to India. And he gives some advice for expats just starting out their expat journeys. He also uh, has some interesting stories to tell. One thing about Dwight is he's a great storyteller. By the way, stick around till the end of the show because we will be playing out with a song written by Dwight. Uh, He's a bit of a musician himself and he wrote a song called Who Threw That Rock and Trust Me. You have to hear the song. Uh, Yeah, just stick around till the end for that. Here's the interview. So the very first guest that I'm going to have on the Expat Life Germany podcast is an Australian who is living in Cologne. He works in television as a transmission controller, whatever the hell that is. Uh, He's written several books about space travel, uh, including a book called Live TV from the Moon and Skylab Mission Reports. And he just directed a documentary film uh, about Skylab. Uh, If you don't know it, uh, don't worry, nor did I when I heard about it. And that's exactly why Dwight made the film. It's a 70s US space station, and Dwight just made the first documentary about it. So it's probably a bad idea to have you as the show's first guest. (laughs) Why would that be? (laughs) Well, actually, the reason is uh, you're probably the most famous person that I know. uh, In fact, you're you're by far the most famous person that I know. The only way to go after having Dwight Stephen Bonietzky on your show is down. There's no – this is the peak. There is probably not going to be a film director coming on this show in the near future. I dare suggest that you can't go any further down than you already are with me on the show. (laughs) (laughs) So 
Anyway, maybe the only way is up. We'll we'll see we'll see how it is after this uh, little talk that we're going to have. What is a transmission controller? Transmission controller is somebody who controls the transmission. Okay, got it. <laughs> Moving on. Next topic. <laughs> it's always always a pleasure talking to you, Dwight. Oh, you know, I, I like to enlighten the people listening. Um, mm-hmm. What I do is I look after the channel playout of the RTL Media Group. Okay. Uh, TV stations like Vox, um, RTL, mm-hmm. Super RTL, the Pay TV, mm-hmm. RTL Plus. Mm-hmm. Uh, I sit in a control room with a bank of monitors, and everything is now automated and uh, played off c- computer hard disk. There's no longer any so tape you don't have involved to do anything. in the- <laughs> So you, you literally just sit there doing nothing? I get paid to watch television in the general sense of the word. Um, <laughs> trouble is, these days you very rarely see um, – errors happening on air and that's because we're actually doing our job basically what what happens when we have a a system failure or whatever i'm responsible for uh, along with my uh, work colleagues to to make Mm. sure the channel stays broadcasting we've got backup systems and things like that so Uh while we're trying to determine the fault we also have to make sure the audience still has something to watch okay how did you end up in transmission controlling how does does one study for that you can. Trouble is, it's not a very well-known job. And the whole thing in television anyway is these jobs are basically who you know, not what you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, with with me, I used to work for Foxtel in Sydney. Okay. And I was in um, videotapes, which at that point, they were digitizing their entire uh, um, archives. So the transmission guides were right opposite the department that I was working in uh, because we had to communicate with them because we were responsible. We were the last point of call for the program uh, tapes in those days to go Mm -hmm. to in order for them Mm -hmm. to be transmitted. Mm -hmm. And I I used to sit in uh, on night shift when, when all the work had been done in, in the trans in the tape department. Right. And a job came up and the guys actually said, Dwight, you've been sitting here asking questions. Why don't you apply for it? You know, you know what you have to do. You've, you've been here often enough. Yeah. And so that's how I got into transmission. Okay. And um, I am actually a trained editor. I, that, that is my qualification. I edit mm. video and edit uh, film. So that's all basically a big jumble pot. I actually did an internship in San Diego with a cable TV company called Daniel's Cable Vision. Okay. They no longer <laughs> exist, but I, I – With a name like that, it's a pity. Daniel's yeah. Cable Vision. Well, Bill Daniels w- was known as the father of cable television in the United what? States. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you worked for the the grandfather of uh, cable television. Yeah, I did. How long were you in San Diego? I was in San Diego for what was it? Two years. Okay. How did you get to Germany from San Diego? Was there stuff in between, or did you just kind of? Yes. Um, how did it come about? I uh, was talking with a friend of mine who worked for Nickelodeon about my background because my mother uh, is German, uh, father Polish. Mm-hmm. And he, he, we had this discussion about my family history and, you know, how I was looking at possibly going to Europe at some point. Mm. And two weeks later, he calls up and goes, Dwight, there's this company in, uh, in the UK that are uh, looking for people, transmission guys. Uh, why don't you apply for it? And I look it up and it's a Polish multi-channel, like a pay TV for Poland. Mm. It was the first company to, to open up in the new post-communist era of offering right. uh, a television platform. And I thought, well, I can't speak Polish. I, was, I, I do have uh, Polish nationality by birth, but uh, yeah. oh, there's nothing, there's nothing, nothing as, as uh, heartwarming as going into the Polish embassy here in, in Germany and speaking German to them and saying, I'm a Polish citizen. They love it. <laughs> I'm sure they do. I'm a busy guy. I've got stuff to do. Yeah, okay. I'd love to learn Polish, but you know, I need to then yeah. devote an hour a day for for at least three months no. before I can. And how often are you going to be in Poland? Let's be. Uh, let's be so, well, now that I'm married to a Polish woman, uh, uh, often it's enough. True. It's true. Did you meet? So Alex is your wife. Did you meet her before or after the move to Germany? Before I met her uh, when I went to England. We worked okay. for the same company there. Right. Um, n- nothing happened between us while I was working for Vizia Television in, in uh, the UK. But afterwards, we stayed in contact and then, um, you know, uh, yeah, one thing yeah, led yeah. to another. No, I don't. Uh, I don't know, Dwight. I would, uh, no, would you I would like, like me to, to explain more. it? Oh, no, good. I think yeah, we're, good. Well, we're good. We're good. We, otherwise, I have to slap an explicit on this uh, podcast. And I, <laughs> yeah, I want to exactly. keep, keep it open to the millions of fans that we can have. Uh, so... So wait, but now you were you were moving to Poland then, 
or to England? No, to England, working for a Polish company. The thing was, the, the Visia could not get a license to transmit in Poland itself, so they mm. skirted around that by using the European tra- Trans Border Agreement or something. I think it's called, Ooh. and that allowed them to transmit into the country, but they had to be based in the UK, which is where they got their transmission license from. <laughs> okay. And I thought, well, for me, you know, being so fluent in Polish as I am, being in the UK is not a bad yeah. thing. So I, yeah. I went over to England. And um, I never had a desire to go to England, put it that way. And although it was it was a fun place to visit, to live there was not my cup of tea. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was looking at then returning to Australia. And while I was doing that, I thought, well, I can speak German. Let's have a could look you, what's available in Germany. You, you could already speak German. Yes, I could. Yes, I could. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, I thought then I was pretty fluent, right? And then yeah. – uh, my then, God. then you move to Germany. I know, and then you're like, "What the hell?" <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Oh, and the problem man. is when you start with when you come when you come here with a basic level of German uh, or even a fairly good level of German, Germans kind of assume that you're completely fluent in, and they start rattling off at you and uh, expecting you to understand. <laughs> yeah, it. yeah don't quite, they? Uh, or the yes. best is when you get like contracts sent to you or, or whatever, and you're reading it, going, "Oh God." Am I, I holding the paper the know, right way up? I know, I know. <laughs> contracts, contracts are my absolute worst, worst. Okay, so then you found something in Germany, this job, RTL. I did, yes. Uh, at that time, they had just expanded the television market, and they were desperately looking for transmission people. And it was really funny. I, I was subscribed to a web a web program called JobPilot.de, mm-hmm. and using my very fluent German, as we were just talking about, I typed in search terms for what ended up being IT, (laughs) right? And so I kept getting all these offers, lots of them, but it was like, yeah, I'm not really IT. I mean, I I could probably do it, but there's no way I can. getting all these IT offers? And then – I'm a transmission controller, for God's sake. So then um, (laughs) – There was one day I was was reading the internet and they had, at that time, there was a company called Kirsch Media in Munich and they had an article that was written first in German and then in English and they were Mm -hmm. talking about transmission and I'm like, oh, 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 great. So I look and I see the term for transmission controller, Zender Abwickler. Mm -hmm. So I put that into uh, the the jobpilot.de and then I had about 60 jobs spat back at me on the internet. I'm like, Oh my this God. Is it. Where, Jackpot. where was this one? <laughs> so I just sent off letters left, right, and center. RTL contacted me and said, we're interested in you. And I looked at where they were based, and it was Cologne. And at that time, my grandmother was still alive up in North Germany. Okay. And I thought, well, you know, if I have to travel to her for any reason, it's going to be a lot easier to get from Cologne by car sure. to to, uh, to the coast up there uh, near, near Oldenboy. Mm-hmm. And so I, I was more partial to working in Cologne. So then I booked the ferry, drove across, uh, went up to visit my, my grandmother and then drove down to Cologne the next day and did the interview. And this is this is where then suddenly I realized that my fluency in German was not as good as I had thought it was, right? So I, I come into the building and I'm, I'm in the uh, lift going up to where I'm holding the interview, and I'm like, "Oh, what were you thinking, mate? This is this is not a picnic. This is uh, yeah, serious this, stuff. This is real. This is real." Yep. And I'm like, "Okay, okay, okay. Before you do anything, just remember: don't say "do," say "z," which is the formal <laughs> version of you, yeah. and take your time before you answer and make a fool of yourself. Right? So we did this That's- whole interview. That's not how I know you, Dwight. You never think before speaking. <laughs> oh, this, this time I took a breath. It was like, how do I okay. formulate this? Yeah. And we did this interview. It went for 90 minutes, got on really well with them. Mm-hmm. And at the end of it, my my uh, supervisor, now supervisor of, of the entire transmission department, he just said to me, Dwight, would you like something to drink? And I was just thinking, oh, my God, I'm so uh, exhausted. And I just uh, out loud said, a vodka straight. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> Did I just say that? I didn't. Yep. I wasn't just and thinking then, that, right? I was just I like, that. oh, no. I blew it. <laughs> and then they were, everybody, the secretaries and and uh, the, the bosses were in stitches, right? Yeah, I think and that like, okay, you okay, your job. Okay. And then I, I heard afterwards from, from uh, his secretary 
that he, she said that comment that we've never heard anything like it. And, uh, and he said to me, we have to take him on. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way you get a job. Just ask for a vodka at the end. If I had known. Right. So then, <laughs> um, that was December 23rd, 2001, right? Of okay. course, then Christmas, New Year's and all the rest of it. Yeah. I had to wait that two and a half weeks until they had come back from uh, Christmas holidays and all that. And they said, yep, we'll love to take you on and uh, we'll f- start the ball rolling to get your work permit and all that sort of stuff sorted out. <laughs> and that's when the real adventure started, right? Because in those days, it's, it's all very streamlined now. In those days, you first had to go and get the permission to be in Germany in the first place. And as an Australian, I was allowed to be in Germany while I was awaiting the decision for the work okay. permit and the rest of it, right? right? Now, this is a case of bureaucracy uh, in in its extreme with departments mm-hmm. not speaking to each other. So I go extreme to the- Extreme bureaucracy, bureaucracy in Germany. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah such a thing doesn't exist, surely. <laughs> um, so I go there and I get the stamp in my passport that says I'm allowed to work. But because I had not yet had a work permit, they put a little note in there Arbeit nicht erstattet, right? Now, that's not a problem because the thing was only valid for three months, which yeah. is how long they envisioned the, the yeah. process to get the, the uh, work permit. So then I go down to the Arbeitsamt, and the first mm. thing they say is, well, you're not allowed to work. We can't give you a work permit. It says here in your passport, that's right? So it was good. this backwards and forwards. I'm like, ah, oh, here mm. we go. Uh. It, took, it took approximately three and a half months for them to sort everything out. I got here on March the 1st. And the work permit was not granted until, I think, May the 8th. So <laughs> it ended up being that the head of resor- human resources at RTL called the Arbeitsamt up and said, look, we've had cable layers who get their work permit within a week. Why is yeah, this guy crazy. who's qualified and we need uh, has to wait and wait and wait? And thankfully, thankfully, I had a little bit of a uh, sum saved up from England. At yeah. that time, the pound was very strong against the uh, newly started euro. And uh, I was able to, to scrape a living together while I was waiting for this uh uh, uh, per- situation with the permit to take to be resolved, yeah. and then as well the the company were really cool. They um, they said, well, look, there is a provision that we're allowed to pay you your uh, moving costs. Mm. So th- they organised that. So after sweating for a while, it all came good at the end of it. Okay, it that's how I ended up in in Germany. But it sounded like you. It sounds to me like you really wanted to leave. Australia was this plan? Were you planning this to be a temporary time in Germany, just to be closer to family here, or was this always going to be a permanent move for you? Uh, there was always the desire to make it long term, permanent. Every time I go back to Australia, I'm like, oh, you know, to, to come back here would not be a problem for me. Uh, really? It's, it's not like I left Australia and it's like good riddance. So I don't want to see you again. Yeah. That's not at yeah. all the case. I go back there yeah. and I, I see uh, the lifestyle and the mentality yeah. and I, that's my yeah. home. I know what you're speaking about as well. I get the same thing with South Africa. I mean, South Africa has a few more problems than Australia though um, with crime and, and things like that. But I still also get go back there sometimes and see that just how relaxed everything is and uh, the beautiful beaches and the, the beautiful climate. It's, uh, it, it's uh, quite something. Well, th- that reminds me of uh, Trevor Noah talking about how mm. the fellow in England told him the two problems they have in South Africa. You have that crime and you have the vuvuzelas. <laughs> <laughs> That's accurate. And now we've introduced the vuvuzela to the rest of the world, so I'm feeling much better about things. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it will be a plague on the world. When did Germany become your home? Because I know for me, I think it was about five years after I'd been in Germany and I went back on a visit to South Africa and I kind of got out and I started feeling like a tourist in my own, you know, my own hometown, basically. And even even though I had a lot of family and friends there, it slowly started to be that Germany was my my home and where I felt most at home. When did that happen to you? When did that happen? No, uh, we, <laughs> no. My my mother came out to Australia in 1961, and that's when Australia was really <laughs> the arse end of the world, right? Mm. Uh, it's still think, the arse end of the world, just to be clear. How long does a flight from Germany to Australia take, Dwight? Well, why do they build Germany so far away from the greatest country in the world then? <laughs> Hello? <Okay. laughs> the fools. All right, all right. All right. <laughs> it takes 22 hours if you fly mm-hmm. with uh, Emirates or Qantas. Mm-hmm. Anyway, now, continue. Sorry. That's right. And m- mum always said to me, you know, it doesn't matter where I am. That becomes my home. Okay. 
right? That's and a good philosophy. I've, I've had that feeling as well, you know, where, where, when I rented that place. That was my home. But mm. now I'm here. This is my home. If I was to move back to Australia... That would be your home. It would be my home. Um, I do see the changes when I go back to Sydney, but because we go there regularly, it's not like I, okay. I go there and go, whoa, what? The, although last time we were there, that was after a two-year break because we didn't go back because of making the movie. We just didn't yeah. have the budget all the time. Yeah. And there had been enough changes with new buildings and all that around an area that used to be rural. You uh, built the Sydney Opera House. When did that happen? Sydney Opera House, yes. Mm. Okay, so um, things have changed in Sydney. They, they are changing, but I do still feel at home there, you know. And, and the second, especially in Parramatta, I'm actually not from centre of Sydney. I'm from 30 kilometres outside. And Parramatta was the very first town that the uh, English settlers came to. It's okay. the oldest town in Australia from European settlement. Okay. Uh, and there is a slightly different mentality. We are affectionately or, or nastily referred to as Westies. Westies, okay. Right. And basically every w- sentence you put together starts, has a, this word in the middle and ends in a swear word. <laughs> also, how I know you, Dwight. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. I don't know. Am I allowed to, to give you an example or is that... Yeah, uh, give me an example. Okay, I'll give you an example. I may have to beep it out, but give me an example. Yes. A normal person would say, oh, we're going to the football this afternoon. Mm-hmm. When you're in, a Westie uh, say it? A Westie would say, we're going to the football this fucking afternoon, eh? Hey. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I've got so much beeping to do. Uh, mark it down on the editor sheet. Okay. Yes, you've I'll got the to, time got some work to do. Maybe, maybe I just make this an explicit podcast and leave it in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what about – so in Cologne, is there – are you – part of a big expat community or are you pretty well integrated are you, like most of your friends German or uh, yeah well we've, we've, uh, mixed I actually do know South Africans here as well so we all I find they're a little less but they are around they are, they are well you South can't Africans miss around. them no not with, with these accents <laughs> no that's right devilishly good looking as well though the South Africans in general Processing, 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 system overload for system overload. <laughs> <laughs> so Skylab, the uh, space station in the 1970s, you have just done a movie about it uh, called yes. Searching for Skylab. That's correct. Um, how long did it take you to make that movie? Okay. From initial concept to when we finished it, approximately five years. Yeah, I know. And I, uh, I knew you through the process and I know uh, that it was quite a, a uh, challenging process let's just put it that way let's use the word challenging challenging yeah there's a lot of up it was a rocky road to get where mm. we're at mm. um but the movie's trying. good dwight it's good well we we got ourselves a really good uh, band to write the theme song for it ah yes you did <laughs> uh so I, I, now um, we have to talk about how we ended up getting in contact with each other yes we do that was a um, flight out to new delhi and I remember you coming down behind us. We had just gotten into the seats and I see this guy and I'm like, oh, God, he doesn't look too friendly. Shit. Now I'm going to sit here for 10 <laughs> hours next to this unfriendly bugger. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then he you has a shifty your mouth. look about him. Yeah, and then you open your mouth. And I'm like, oh, you are South African. Oh, God. Yes. <laughs> I, I dread sitting next to people on planes, as I think many people do. It, it, at least you had your wife on the one side so you could completely ignore me. My, one of my th- absolute pet peeves on planes is that I'm going to sit next to someone that wants to talk to me. It's just when I'm on a plane, I just want to be left alone. I just whatever. And as it so happened, I happened to sit down next to someone who wanted to talk to me. (laughs) (laughs) But as it turned out, it was a, it was, um, it was a good chat because we got, I remember we, we started talking about the plane we were on. The, the flight to India was on a Dreamliner. That's right. Yeah. But anyway, we got to, we got to talking and we actually did follow up with each other after the flight. We got, I think we hooked up on Facebook. Yeah, we did. Be, I, I don't know. The, you, you, you didn't, you didn't want to talk to me on the plane. You were like, oh God, please shut up. Please shut up. And then, and then, and then I'm in Australia. Mask on. Yeah. And then I, I, I get this message on Messenger from you going, oh, it's, it's Sean here. Remember me from the plane? Let's hook up. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know what was funny though? I remember um, I was so Im- I was just impressed that you were a writer because when when I was sitting next to you and we started talking about the Dreamliner and then we got onto I realized that you knew a lot about aeroplanes, a lot, uh, like a lot. Um, 
like more than one human being should actually know. And then I, um, you got, you told me that you'd written a book, which I guess you just drop into every conversation. I would, if I'd written a book, I would just say it every time I saw someone. Um, and then I was like, wow, that is impressive. I have just met a writer. And then when I got off the plane in India, one of the first things I did was look up on Amazon to see your books. And the one cost 150 euros. I was like, nah. I was going to buy one out of solidarity solidarity and support for my new friend. I was like, no, not for 150 euros. Uh, actually, Live TV from the Moon is now available, so you can get it for a reasonable price of, I think, 30 US dollars. So Yeah, I'm waiting for my free copy. That's signed. Again, this awkward silence. <laughs> and, and no, because then how we started talking about music that got you yes. involved. Uh, yeah, so I, you ended up asking me to or my band to 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 uh, write the song that you used on the end credits for Searching for Skylab, which yeah. was great fun. Yeah, so Searching for Skylab, how much was shot in, shot in Germany? You kind of flew all over the world shooting, uh, interviewing astronauts and whatnot. We but did you do shot- a lot in Germany? Uh, no, um, yeah. we shot in Germany at the Hamburg observatory where we interviewed Dr. Lubas Kohotek, who discovered the comet that they observed on the last mission. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I just had this thought while I was rattling off that fact, <laughs> everything else is just a hodgepodge of weirdness. And then suddenly yeah. Skylab, it's very serious. And I know these facts, <laughs> <laughs> by the way, for, for those who are listening, we, uh, Dwight and I actually had another or do another podcast called searching for Skylab podcast. And, uh, we discussed, that's why I felt it as well. The moment I started asking about Skylab, I was slipping back into the searching for Skylab podcast kind of r- rhythm. Well, well let, let me answer that in the way that it should be answered. Uh, Searching for Skylab, which is available on Vimeo.com yeah, for Vimeo.com. fifteen ninety nine to purchase or four ninety nine to rent, uh, is put, a very uh, enlightening film I'll about link, Skylab. I'll put the link uh, in the show notes for this podcast. So if uh, anyone wants to check it out, go and have a look at the show notes on expatlifegermany.de, and uh, you can find the link to the Vimeo movie. So, Dwight, uh, for people coming to Germany, for expats, Let's say they've just arrived in Germany. What is your biggest one? What is one bit of advice that you can give them? Just one. That like the have, number one thing. Have patience. <laughs> have patience have with patience. the German authorities. You know, I, yes, I hundred percent agree. And I think that is the first thing that people are faced with when they come to Germany is you go to an Ausländer Behördeamt, and yep. and what what always amazes me about the Ausländer Behördeamt, which is the what do you, what what would you translate that as the Foreign, uh, foreign Affairs Bureau. Foreign, yeah, Foreign Affairs. Uh, the first thing that you realize when you go to the Foreign Affairs Office, where you would expect, expect that they at least speak English, that none of them do. And so many of these people are coming into the country, uh, the new, new expats, they can't speak a word of German. Um, mm. And I get it maybe later on when, you, when you're applying for German citizenship and whatnot. There I can understand, yes, okay, German only in these, in these things. But in the beginning, for God's sake, just, you know, make it easy to communicate for these people that are struggling. Um, but, yeah, I think that is, a, that is a fantastic piece of advice is be patient with the authorities. The one thing I've noticed that it, it has gotten me uh, great service don't go in there and like every other German, oh, the Behörde here, they, all they do is sit around twiddling their thumbs, right? Yeah. You go in there and you say, you know, I, I admire you for your patience. Uh, there's a lot of people here that would drive me crazy and I know you're just doing your job and I need yeah. your help. Yeah. Right? They do. The second you say that, they just sit back and go, somebody gets it, what it's like being in our position where we have to deal Agreed. with all these yeah. people day after day. and. Like, for example, I was at the Zollamt. You know, I had to pick up a package from the U.S. in making the film. And it's in a part of Cologne that I don't frequently visit, right? So I don't know it. Mm-hmm. And I needed to get back by uh, by the S-Bahn, mm-hmm. right? And everyone says you, c- you can't ask a Beamter for help in, in the timetable for the train. They're not going <laughs> to no. give it to you. They're not interested. Yeah. And I was chatting away and I just, you know, we we're talking about paying taxes. And I said, well, why do people get – upset that they have to come in and pay the toll, pay the duty right. on, on articles that they know they bought from the U.S. and they know are subject yeah. to, to thinking. And I must said, have been like, thank you. Yeah, Someone and I said, well, come on, you know, who doesn't understand that taxes go to making the yeah. city a better place, you know, right? It, yeah. it, built, it fixes the roads, it, it, whatever, <laughs> right? I spoke their language. Yeah, exactly. Right? And, and then they're sitting there. With him. Yeah, and they're like, oh. And I said, look, one, one little problem. I, I'm not familiar with this area. How do I get back to the center of Cologne? 
they went online and they printed out the uh, the train <laughs> schedule for me and they said and 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 just so I'll draw you a little map how you can get to the get to the, the railway station. We're, we're going to guide you there ourselves. Come on, I'm going to drive you over there. It was pretty much like that, and I thought yeah. you know that's all you need to do because yeah. unfortunately, and this is the part of German uh, culture that I don't like this unpleasantness when you're dealing with somebody in a shop or wherever the the germans yes. have this m- m- way of being yes. super unfriendly yes i that's exactly it and it's not just unfriendly sometimes just completely not interested at all I, i've seen it so many times where you're sta- you're standing right next to the sales assistant and they're doing something else typing something in a, a computer or something and they will flat out ignore you even if you make some kind of sounds or say excuse me or something like that they will ignore you until they are ready to to uh break to, wind to in front of them that'll get their attention <laughs> that that helps break wind in front of them i think that you know what dwight i've changed my mind that is the biggest bit of advice that you can give our listeners <laughs> that break wind in front of unfriendly germans that's what i'm talking about that's why people are going to come to this show that's why they're going to download this podcast for those nuggets <laughs> exactly yeah well he, he told me that if i broke wind it would help <laughs> <laughs> people i want you to try this and write to us and let us know if it worked oh, no no please don't try it <laughs> um you you mentioned the movie is on vimeo searching for skylab um you can check it out there's a trailer there and uh yeah you can either rent it or buy it you have a website searching for skylab.com you, we have a podcast. People can find that searching for Skylab uh, podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And um, what else? You're, you're on Twitter at yes. SF underscore Skylab, I think it is. So that is that is how you find Dwight. It's been so much fun talking to you. I really appreciate. I really appreciate you being the first guest. You know, maybe when this uh, this show gets to like 200 episodes, 300 episodes, we'll have you back on. Maybe we'll that's see. right. And I'll just maybe. we'll carry on with the same banter, and everyone will go, "Ah, oh, not these not guys again. again!" Not again. So that was Dwight Stephen Bonietsky, and I just want to thank him for taking the time to sit down with me and have a chat and share his nuggets of wisdom that he has for expats living in Germany. Next week, we have Noor from Pakistan, who's been in Germany for two years, and he tells us some of his stories, as well as a run-in that he had with neo-Nazis. So stick around for that. Subscribe to the podcast. We have some very, very cool guests coming in the next weeks. And if you want to hear them, subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, like our Facebook page, Expat Life Germany. We also have a uh, Facebook group, Expat Life Germany, which is linked to the page. So join that and get in on the discussion or let's start having discussions because uh, it's so brand new. There's nothing, nothing much happening there yet. So let's start it. Let's get it happening. And uh, on Instagram, Expat Life Germany, on Twitter, Expat Life DE. Get in touch. Let me know what you think. Give me some topic ideas. And if you want to be on the show, if you want to be a guest, go to expatlifegermany.de and click on the be on the show link and you will be on the show or you could be on the show. I can't guarantee it, but you could be. You could just click it and try. Let's let's see what happens. Maybe we'll sit down and have a chat. I don't know. Let's see. Uh, expatlifegermany.de. You can also find show notes for this show. Do all of the clicking. Get on board. Let's you know, let's take this forward. Now, to get out of here, we're going to play a song, and it's a song actually by Dwight. I didn't include his story about the song in the interview because I felt like there was so much other stuff that we were talking about. Uh, I cut it out, but it, the long and short of it is he wrote a song with a friend of his in in the 80s, and they recorded it in the 90s. It's a song called Who Threw That Rock? And I divide my life up into two phases. Before I heard Who Threw That Rock and after I heard Who Threw That Rock. So it is a great honor for me to be playing out episode two of the expat life germany podcast with the world premiere of a song called who threw that rock take a listen let me know what you think we'll see you next time walking down the street one day i saw a rocket came away i tried to make it to a shed but that my rock hit my head and threw that rock and threw that rock It hit me real fair and square, and that's how much I had to swear. The looking round, I could see people hit just like me. And through that rock, and through that rock, and through that rock. The clocks came round to stop the fuss, but they got hit just like us. The rocks started coming from the south, and I got the beauty in a mouth. And through that rock, and through that rock, and through that rock. A barrage roar hit the
the floor and lighter rocks as always saw the whole damn tree was a mess but through those rocks no bloody less hey, through that rock hey, through that rock hey, through that rock Through that rock!